And I think today what I'm inviting and so inspired to be with you all is that uh, part of that invitation to be with the sacred in the everyday, which is actually about being in attending and in a simplicity and in a resonance with the diverse energies and processes that go on around us all the time. And I think this particular transformative time that we're in has helped to discover what it means to ground and to slow down and to notice and to be with. And this practice in the kitchen is very much about being with food. I think that beautiful Upanishad's quote, first no food, from food all things are born, but by food they live, toward food they move, and into food they return. That has been a mantra for guiding my life as a, a Zen cook or a culinary activist cook, as I have been called. And I suppose, first of all, I'd like to share some gratitude. Gratitude to Sarah Watley, gratitude to Kate and Lily of Cedar, who essentially have helped manifest this practice in a kitchen, studio, and given this transformative time where we cannot move out of our spaces, it's about how do we invite a digital uh, experience of these living processes. So that's what Flora and I are going to um, discover and uncover what happens in this kitchen. So also to thank Michel Pambert, because he is the director of CORE, Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience. And without his vision and his courage and his tenacity to have an artist working as a researcher within a social science and natural science um, centre at Coventry University, I think it was, it was a journey to have that manifest a PhD that is a practice-based PhD that informs the theory that comes out of it, which we all know that actually without the making and the experiencing, we cannot really know. So the artful body-mind is that understanding that we come into consciousness through being with matter, through being with uh, the, the, the glory of the foods that are around us, that somehow we hide away and we don't give her time and the energy and the space for being with them. So this is the cupboard of love. And the cupboard of love is an honoring of Chris Seeley, who was to be my supervisor. Uh, and sadly, um, she left us. So throughout my PhD, she was working with me on the other side, but she had a cupboard of love, which was filled with the spices and the foods that had um, uh, shared with her the journeys she'd been on. And we had the chance to go through the cupboard of love with her before in her last weeks of life uh, to sort of create a, a space of coherence and um, integrity around the foods. And it was a way of her sharing her history. So this is a cupboard of love that we have made ourselves. It is about bringing to the fore the foods that um, were called to us so that we're not thinking from recipes, we're actually manifesting food that has come from being in an inspiration with what we see. So for example, here we've got some marrow fat peas that have actually been grown um, locally um, and they're organic, they're from uh, hodvadods and they're lentils and they're um, buckwheat. So this is a way of honoring the local and the cyclical. I think that idea of, of living processes means that we're being in touch and in tune with the seasons and also with our desires, like what's calling to us. So. What's calling to me now is for me to show you a little of this practice with this, can I introduce you to Adora. This is the beautiful dresser, French dresser, which called to Flora to um, uh, help me manifest my practice as a, uh, an artisan artist, making food from the land, from the seasons, um, from what's out in the garden, which is just beyond the kitchen, a little kitchen garden where the herbs are growing. So for example, um, 
today what called me was to make a fresh mint infusion so um that will become uh, a base for some of my soberistas these are ways of making um, alcohol free tonics and elixirs um, so that we are happy to be drinking uh, and sharing in the spice and the buzz of elixirs that don't necessarily give us headaches. Um, so these are what I've been working with over the last year. And Adora is called Adora because when I first saw her, I adored her. And it's about that relationship, making a relationship with the vessels, making a relationship with the utensils, making a relationship with the actual, the ingredients that we're using so that they are, um, they are honored in vessels that have, have um, a beauty to them. So it's about the idea of conviviality. Kate spoke about hospitality. The word hospitality is also about bringing an ethics into place by honoring the food that comes from the place. And the word conviviality is about how do we live well together. So um, I think I love living well with the ingredients that I work with. So for example, <clears throat> what I was, have been making over the last week has been a sourdough leaven from an organic rye flour that is grown within five to ten miles of here. And this leaven is on its way to, to bubbling. As you can see, it's got a beautiful fullness. And it needs the air in order to attract the wild yeasts. And the lactic acids, it needs the flour, which is its food. So the flour over the last uh, six, seven days, I've been making this leaven, which has started off with flour and water, and then some of these raisins, which help um, also attract some of the yeast because of their sugars. What we're doing is attracting um, sugars to feed uh, the leaven. So the leaven means a leaven is uh, a, a natural yeast. Um, and it becomes a fermented sourdough um, after some time. So you can always begin your own leaven. And this has been preparing itself to be with us during these musings with the kitchen. And it's, it's, it's for me, what is so grounding and inspiring is that these processes are living processes and they keep us in tune with the living processes of nature and the energies and the forces and the, the, um, the, the manifestations that happen through a natural cycle. So in making sourdough leavens and making breads out of them, we're actually participating in a biodiversity. So I love to call making a leaven biodiversity in a bowl or making fermented cabbage. For example, here's some fermented cabbage made a month ago, a red cabbage. And again, that is not only um, good for the, uh, the gut flora, but it is a way of preserving the beautiful colors throughout the season so that you can be eating red in the middle of winter when there wouldn't be necessarily that particular vegetable or plant. So this idea of biodiversity in a bowl is uh, a way of us being in tune with what I'm calling, and what came out of my research, uh, sympoetic uh, resonance, a sympoetic sensibility, which means that we are making with nature. We're not just thinking, oh, I'm going to create something from a recipe, but actually the recipe comes from what's in the garden. So the menus and the, the meals or the particular processes become an interaction with the natural forces and with the energies and with what's in the air. So this sourdough leaven will be attracting the wild yeasts from timber yard. So my sourdough leaven will be different from your sourdough leaven in your kitchen. 
But what's important is that I think it's also um, uh, is a way of understanding that there's such diversity in our relationships to our cultures and to, to nature that uh, 11 will represent something unique, but it's still 11. So there's that idea that somehow when we're making 11, we're also thinking about our cultures, not just our food cultures, but our cultures as human beings. And there's something very political for me about this spiritual practice because it's about recognizing and honoring difference, um, but knowing that we are also um, in unity. So uh, in South Africa, when I was creating my research, which was called Living Cultures, Agriculture Meets Agriculture, the idea was to bring the kitchen garden into the kitchen and make a relationship. And that was creating these food ritual workshops where people learn to do sourdough fermentations, um, learn to compost food with a, with a fermentation process, um, and also to think about the honeybees. And the idea about that practice was that it showed that food sovereignty and um, the way that we can be with uh, cultures where food is scarce or where there's poverty, what can happen is that you can be working with processes that are very simple, they're not, they're economic, and you're getting the best biodiversity for your gut. So it's actually digestive and nutritional. What happens about a sourdough ferment particularly is that the lactic acids um, and the wild yeasts help to, be, to render the breads more digestible because they neutralize the phytic acids, which from ordinary um, yeasts from, and from in the wheat actually interfere with our digestive process. But as well as that, the rye itself and the sourdough leaven will also invite the, um, the, the ingredients of the leaven itself and the sourdough rye to um, give most of their own nutritional benefit. So a sourdough leaven has a great um, way, is a great way of enhancing our relationship to, to wheats. So that's that what I'm going to do now is just leave this to do a little of its own um, drawing in of the wild yeast. I might add a little bit of water and this water has, as you can see, it has a, a, a carbon rod in it, which is made of charcoal. And this neutralizes the um, chlorine, it acts as a filter. So if you've got water that's either very hard or very soft with a lot of metals in it, it's a good way of preparing the water because otherwise that water can uh, affect the, the, um, the life of the leaven. So now we're going to just let that leaven sit. But as you can see, it's got a beautiful, a beautiful elasticity is already starting to, to happen. Okay, we'll just let that sit for a while. Um, there's also something just about the, the beauty of this flower, which as you can see, it's still got color to it. It's got, it's, it has a, a graininess because it hasn't been um, separated from its wholeness. It's just been ground. Um, <clears throat> then I'd like to move on to um, something that we might So this is um, a kefir, another kind of <coughs> fermentation process, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but these, these rely on grains, two different kinds of grains. Again, this is about how does a kitchen become a place where you're attracting living processes? And if you're attracting living processes from nature and you're working with the bounty of those living processes, um, it actually changes the way you feel about your life. I, I come down in the morning and I'm wondering what is happening with, the, with 11. Um, when, when, when might we taste this kefir? So as you can see here, um, 
I've got two kefirs. One is a water kefir, which has been sweetened. And this time I'm trying to sweeten without using sugar. I'm trying to keep away from gluten and from sugar and from dairy as a way of um, dealing with a, a, a health um, condition that I have, which is arthritis. So these particular foods are really enlivening of my health. So for example, we've got here a water kefir, and this, these are the grains of a water kefir. So they, they look like they're little plant-based, look as though they are little cut up pieces of ginger. And they feed on, on sugars. So usually kefirs need sugars and I've been experimenting. So this is an experimental kitchen as well. I don't really go with recipes. I do have friends who um, obviously share much with me around their practices, culinary artisan chefs and makers. But essentially I, I do a lot of trial and, and, and making, making practices and seeing what happens. So this I've added figs as my, as my uh, sweetener. And this one I think needs a little bit more of a fizz. You can start seeing it's already starting to fizz, which is that's the, that is the ferment happening. Uh, because the sugars are being fed on. And just to give it a little extra boost, rather than using sugar, I'm going to take some date syrup <clears throat> and add it. Now, obviously, here I've got a, a relationship between the local and the global, global because there are no dates growing in my garden, sadly. But I think we also, I am seeking to um, honour um, my, my roots in the earth as well as in Suffolk. Then we have here, so that I'll give a little stir and then let that do its thing. Here is a kefir that is um, known as a uh, kefir for um, usually you're using it with milk. But in this uh, instance, I am making one based out of um, a coconut water. So here again, you'll see this is, this is the actual kefir grain. Do you see that? It looks like a little bit of cauliflower heads. So there's lots of little um, florets of the kefir grain. And again, this is in its fermentation. You can see the bubbles here. And this takes about two to three days. So yeah, look at the bubbles there. I mean, that is doing its thing. So, um, maybe we'll have a little taste of this in our, um, yeah, we'll leave it to ferment a little longer, and then we'll have a taste. This is quite a fresh one. We'll have a taste during our, uh, our half an hour discussion. Okay. So, what else is there to um, invite you into? I think it's about the simplicity of doing these in your own home as well. Um, herbs and flowers can grow in soil in any kind of setting. You don't have to have land, you don't have to have a huge garden. So mints, the mints, the lovage, um, peppers, I use a lot of spices. So this is a pepper. This is peppercorns, a whole string of peppercorns, uh, then just infused with uh, cider vinegar. And that becomes the basis of a shrub. And a shrub, again, is a very, um, it's an old um, recipe that is, again, it's a health-giving tonic. And the basis is a vinegar with some fruit or a spice. So here I've got one. I've added one. Here is one. That's with basil. There is one that I have with black currants. Oh, one with dried prunes. So I've just added dried prunes and balsamic vinegar. And these again take, you know, a couple of weeks and then you've got a fantastic health giving tonic which you can add refreshed to water or you can add a soda to it, bubble water. Yeah, I've done one with green tea. Um, so in a way the larder becomes the medicine chest as well. So we're actually seeing food as a medicine. And I think that what I'd love to take us 
now to is the um, is all the ways that you can be working without machines. Um, I came across this phrase last night. I was thinking about being with you all and being with the food, and <clears throat> I thought, I think these processes and practices are a different way of being with time. The Hopi Indians speak about time having manifest, speak about, in fact, they have no word for time. They talk about what has manifest and what is manifesting. And I was thinking about time in relation to these practices and, and into how my PhD evolved. Uh, my PhD was really a following. It was a following, I was led by the food, I was led by invitations, I was led by books falling out of shelves for me to decide to read. Um, nothing, there was very little of what should I be doing, but letting, letting the body lead, letting the body mind be in a relationship with um, the sympoetic um, universe, which again, the idea of sympoesis comes from a biological uh, term, which is that we are part of an ecosystem. And I think what I love about this kind of kitchen is that it invites us to remember. It is an honoring of the fact that we are part of an ecosystem. We are not the masters, we are not those in control at all. And if we have a relationship with microorganisms in the kitchen and with the, the matter of the food and how it's coming and how it shows itself to us, that we're in a dialogue continuously. And that, that process and practice has come to me from cooking for years on a Zen retreat in Wales, where I cooked in silence. I was cooking for about between 15 and 25 people over a week. And the food came from the place. I collected food throughout my journey from Oxford to Wales. And then the recipes would come from, what was the mood like with the retreat things? What was the mood of the day? How were the vegetables faring? So I was in a constant dialogue with what was in the kitchen and what vessels called to me. Oh, do I feel like cooking with that dish? Um, or um, that particular vegetable which was calling because it needed to be um, worked with because it was on its way to no longer being fresh. But I think what I was wanting to speak about was that idea of a different way of being with time, and that is to be in the flow. And the word art and ritual come from rita, which is an, an, an ancient Sanskrit word, which essentially means being in a, a collaboration, a cooperation, a flow of the dynamic energies of the universe. And I think that's why being an artist is something that I love to reclaim that word because it's about how do we reconnect ourselves as artisans of being with life. So these particular vessels, instead of working with machines, um, I, will, I will pound and I will, with this one, the sesame seeds, I will um, roast the sesame seeds and then to make them more digestible, give them a, a, a circular motion with this. This is called a suribachi and that makes a beautiful gemaisha which becomes like a sesame salt. And this is a beautiful granite. Um, very heavy granite uh, pestle and mortar for grinding. And I think again, that's about what does it mean to be in what I call animus time rather than capitalist time. I'm not trying to get in the kitchen to make something happen quickly to have a meal. The meals sort of evolve through a practice of being with the food. Um, so again here, I had some olive oil. And I thought, mm, I'd love to have some flavored olive oil. So I went into the garden and I found some oregano. And oregano just became part of the infusion. Then I found lovage and um, some sage. So this is a way of just adding a little um, pizzazz to an olive oil, but to do it with yourself. And it'll be cheaper and delicious. So I think that maybe this might be a time to go and be with the table because on the table there are some uh, inspirations I'd like to share with you that came through my research. One of the things that Kate spoke about is that these cedar uh, invites are about how to reconnect with life as researchful and uh, the practice of our dance, the practice of agroecology, the practice of science, 
how do we reconnect all of these with our actual human bodies so they're not abstractions and i think part of this process for me this is about artful science as well as science for art these are an entwining of processes in fact a beautiful book um, by uh, Harold McGee talks about the encyclopedia of kitchen science. So that science actually happens in the kitchen as well as in the laboratory. And uh, I like to think of how we might invite ways of knowing that don't just colonize our ways of knowledge as being ones that come from scientific experiments but they can come from artistic experiments as well and this is this for me is a, a, a process in in a, an experimentation that is how do we bring living processes back into our lives through food and that's back to that wonderful Upanishads ancient Indian uh, wisdom that if we know food if we are dealing with food, if we are growing food, if we are in a tending and an attention and a, a, a reverence and tenderness with food, that will invite a very different way of living life because the life will then be um, guided by how can my day create food which nourish my body, which nourish my mind, and therefore will nourish my thinking and give a particular kind of thinking and an energy because it's based on food that's of nature that's based on natural processes living process will affect the way we think so first knowing food is 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 going back to basics in terms of nature culture living i don't know how talks about natural cultures and the idea we are not just nature we're not just culture we are in an entwining and that idea of entanglement between nature and culture which is so beautifully explicitly brought manifest in a kitchen so the idea of cooking with the body mind the artful body mind is um we're not just cooking menus and recipes and dishes and ingredients we're cooking a way of life and that again is part of a beautiful Zen practice that has guided me in my work as an artist and a, and a cook, a culinary activist, a cuisinière, is that um, a 12th century monk and master, Dogen, believed that enlightenment came in the kitchen through the relationship with food and the attention and the, the grace and, the, and the, the subtlety and the simplicity of what one brought into being through kitchen processes. So um, I've got a few cards here to help prompt me. So I must say I did really like this idea of a difference between animist time and capitalist time because it means that we're not going according to a factory, we're not going according to a clock, we're going according to uh, a much more cyclical and holistic relationship to time in the kitchen of an artisan nature allows that to happen. Um, we're awakening the senses in the kitchen like this and we're trusting in the body as our compass that the mind is not separate from the body and therefore if we allow ourselves to be in tune and awakened by our senses and letting the body lead in our practices not just in the kitchen but in life that becomes a very different way of approaching being a human being. Um, what else have we got? The idea of being, being with, the, with the, the, the processes and attending to them brings a lot of tenderness into your life. And we've talked about that. The idea of collaboration, that collaboration is not just with other human beings, it's about a collaboration with nature and its processes. And that's that idea again of sympoesis. Sim meaning uh, with and poesis meaning to make. So I, I found that that way of theorizing my practice that I was making with life and that my practice as an artist and a researcher were part of enlivening a relationship to 
being a, being a human being. And I think convivial is another word that I'd like to add to this um, conversation. And I'd also like to bring Flora in because her work as a collaborator during my PhD, she was my thinking partner, actually helped to amplify the processes because of her documentation, but also of the conversation exchanges that we shared, which were very profound because they helped me distance myself from my own understanding, my own ego, so that I became much more part of an ecosphere, what I'm calling an ecosphere of research and practice. And conviviality, that word conviviality was also reclaimed. It's not just about having a good time. Conviviality comes from the word convivere, which means to live well together. And my practice as an artist and a cuisinier and a researcher, we're looking for the ways that food can help awaken us to ways that we can be living well together through these living processes, some of which I have just shared with you. Um, fermentation, I've spoken, spoken a little bit about that and how fermentation not only is a practice in enlivening food, but we can also be transforming our own cultures through fermentation by fermenting new ideas. So I love that metaphor. I love the metaphor that happens with matter in a fiction as well. The idea of enlivening transformation, not just because you're creating a, a sourdough um, or a fermented cabbage, as one of the participants in my research in South Africa, a young black farmer said when he learned to ferment cabbages, he said, this is a practice in food security. That this is about how do I transform my own communities with these new ideas about bringing a solidarity and uh, a politics of food cultures into the ecology of, of his communities in South Africa. Um, belonging. I love that word, longing. What are we yearning for? One of the questions that I asked during my research when I created a field uh, feast in the middle of the field, an organic field, a biodynamic field, I set up a dice ecologists and farmers and journalists and practitioners and bread makers to come to share food in the, in the field, which in the field uh, where the cows were roaming around the field. So it was the idea of bringing food to the place of its own origins and to be eating the food from the place when you're eating food from within five miles. Uh, and the idea, the question was to everybody, what are we hungry for? So again, that was a metaphorical question because we were hungry for the food and we were also hungry for something in our lives. So that idea of longing, and what is it we're longing for? And I love the idea of adding the B in front so that we are belonging. What does it mean to be belonging to our time, belonging to our bodies, belonging to our nature, belonging to our communities, belonging to each other? So at this point, I'd love to bring Flora in and have some sense of what it has been like to work with um, a practice which invites you as a geographer mm -hmm. and a gardener uh, and a doctor of your own in your own right who was uh, wrote a PhD on how can we live in better ways through the accommodation uh, that is built around us so I'd love to invite you in Brilliant. I'm gonna put this down I'm yeah. gonna find you uh, we're just going to rearrange our. Yeah, we're going to sit down at the table. We're going to sit down now. together with you. Oh. I might just put the kettle in as well. Or prepare. Anyway, so yeah. So this is this is Flora, and I had the honour and privilege of having Flora accompany, accompany me throughout the PhD as a thinking partner. So she was very practical. She documented everything. Uh, she was my scribe, my photographer, but the important part was her capacity to enliven my own thinking through her drawing skills and also her own exquisite sensibility. So, mm. Flo, while I put the kettle on, could you just share some of what's 
been arising for you during this this journey yeah thank you um hello everybody uh this is um a complete privilege to be here and reflect on these things with you here at home and um it's very moving actually because we long to share um our everyday life with people but it's hard to imagine how 25 of you would fit in this space so thank you for being here with us and as Mish says, she was very courageous. Um, we have an established collaboration as two independent women artists, but on embarking on her PhD, she was very clear to herself, me, and to CORE, the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, that she wanted to make this journey within our collaboration. And to be absolutely honest, at the very outset, my ego um, had, a, had an evening of, um, feeling as if I would disappear if I spent the next three or four years simply reflecting somebody else's practice and um, I said this and I, I, I was um, distressed and in that distress I then pulled out a long roll of paper and drew how I was feeling and in that moment was born a new practice for me um, my own artful body mind was awakened and I was able to express something that I had been sensing which was an aspect of Mita's biography um, through a drawing and it was the most extraordinarily um, empowering exciting thing to manifest this drawing about how I was deeply feeling and this alchemy of my own um, my initial feeling of questioning what would I do um, suddenly it became an open door that I would discover how my body mind would be an instrument of sensing what I was witnessing and it was an incredibly life-changing experience being that thinking listening partner and I think the most important thing that emerged for me or what I want to share with you all now is that how in making that dedication to each other really to help each other grow through this extraordinary gift of a scholarship for Misha to investigate her practice in making that dedication to go on that journey together we grew so strongly as individuals so it illuminated the the nuances and the the, the theory um the the, the 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 depth of Misha's practice but it also grew me um as a as an artist drawer, as somebody um, fascinated by food, but who had struggled to really inhabit the practice that I loved so much, that I was witnessing so much. So through the four years, I was able to develop my own um, practice of what we call chrysalis drawings, which are abstract, improvised sketches of, of choreographies, of happenings. But I also, I think, arrived home in my own body and that was something that I had been longing for, having done my own PhD in my 20s. Um, and it had been a very powerful experience, but an extremely lonely experience and an extremely, um, um, in a sense, mental activity. Um, suddenly here I was given the chance to revisit the whole process of inquiry, but this time not alone. And this time um, through a very embodied and emergent process. So I, I have I've loved the, the experience of being that witness. And um, I think it also amplifies the core of Misha's thinking, which is that the world is sympoetic, the world is made with, but within that we are also autopoetic. There is such powerful individuality and such strong soul journeys that we're all on. And for me, it's been utterly life-changing and I, I feel very, very committed to sharing the story of our collaboration and how there was never any confusion about whose work it was. Um, and I think when we were in South Africa, actually, uh, when we did share a bit about our collaboration to some young doctoral research students, they felt it was a methodology that would actually help them deal with some very complex emotional journeys that they were going on as researchers. So thank you all. For that time to reflect at our kitchen table. So thanks, Flora. And yeah, the 
one of the theories that I was using for my PhD, which again just came to me through the work of John Haraway, was this concept of autopoiesis and sympoiesis. So autopoiesis was um, had had been brought into um, a, a, a sort of biological academe through um, two researchers, two male researchers, who were thinking about how cells are in a way self-replicating and essentially have their own boundaries. And what Beth Dempster did as, a, as a, an ecologist, she worked with that theory to amplify it and say, well, an ecosystem cannot really be defined quite in the same way um, because it doesn't have those same boundaries, but it does have cooperative processes happening within it. So the idea of working between autopoiesis, which is the self, or self-making, so that essentially a tree would be an example of an autopoietic um, organism, but then the forest is its sympoietic um, uh, habitat. So they, the two, autopoiesis and sympoiesis, need each other to have a relationship, a dialogue. And essentially, I think that's what we're longing for as human beings, is that we are in our self-individualized and um, personalized um, organisms. And it's like, how do we reconnect with the wider ecosphere of our being and our habitats um, as communities, but also the, the communities of the earth, but also the communities of the microorganisms, the soil communities, what's happening um, with plants. So that's, I would say, how bringing to some meta understanding, some greater picture of what it is to know food is that in, we, in, in beginning to deeply know food, we begin to understand our relationship within the natural cultural world. And that it is a, a, a spiritual as well as a political practice, because if you're going to know food in that way and become aware of your relationship to the greater whole, and that you are part of something, not the controller, then that makes a very different uh, exchange between how you begin to constellate a life um, as a human being, because you are not the only one who needs to be taken care of. Mm. And it's that idea of matters of care that we are in a sentient animate world, as well as a human world. And the other than human world needs as much um, recognition and invitation and honoring as does the human world. So that's what it means to first know food in my understanding. It's to become aware of my humanity and my humility as a human being. So I think this is a time now where we're beginning to uh, prepare ourselves to reconnect all together um, and see each other and have uh, some brew, some life-giving brew, some interesting drink to share together over a half an hour um, around a table, our kitchen table, but it may be a different table for you, uh, and start opening up to understanding what this has brought into your day, this particular encounter that we've shared in our studio kitchen, uh, and to hear of some of what your own practices are and what it might be to bring art and ritual and a practice with food back into your everyday lives or how you already are doing it and what it means to become researchers who are understanding that we are searching for something and that practice is actually what leads to knowledge making, not, not um, a theory which then we begin to inhabit. Theory comes from practice. So it'd be lovely to get a sense of all the ways in which um, uh, we can share a conversation. So sure, should we go make that cup of tea and meet everybody back yeah. here in a few minutes? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go and collect the teas and maybe you might um, share a bit of a drawing that you did okay. as part of my conversations. One of the times I was thinking about thinking and Flora had dropped me off at a station and I said, Flora, do you think you could draw what I just <laughs> shared with you? And then she did. So she'll share a little bit of that and I think that will also give a context to our conversation. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm just opening here a beautiful book, which is a manuscript of Misha's PhD. Um, just to illustrate one of the drawings, this is a, a drawing called The Eye of the Other, which was just to amplify what I shared earlier, which is the idea that um, with, with another eye, with a witness, the one's lens, what one able, is able to see is, is um, widened. And then this is what Misha's referring to, which is, um, as she said, that I dropped her off in Cheltenham. She was describing so extraordinarily how the metaphor of 11 um, was exactly what society needed, that the leaven, that rituals are, are leavens to a culture. Um, and that the ritual is a very um, important transformative space. And so um, in the car park, I drew this drawing, which at first might seem um, a bit chaotic. Later on, when we were reconnected, Mish then um, annotated that drawing, and it then became this rather tidier um, table, which essentially is a manifesto of um, how, um, how we get from mother's pride to artisan sourdough how we get from chemical farming to agroecology, how we might get from object thinking through embodied thinking to living thinking, and how as food consumers, we might become food citizens who are becoming active, connected, responsive and, act and um, authentic in their relationship with food. And what kinds of um, models of growing we would need if people became food citizens mm. who participated in a relationship with the farmers and with the, the agriculture. Mm. So the idea that eating is an agricultural act by Wendell Berry means that as, as eaters, we become aware that our eating habits will determine certain kinds of farming practices. But yeah, so that was, thank you for that. And I just had another thought about, um, the leaven and rituals yeah anyway these 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 can be teased out in our conversation but that's right i wanted to share with you what we're having in our tea shall i come and join oh yes that's a great idea i'm just going to take you if i may to the tape sorry there we go oh that's still with me So Flora went out foraging today in the little the woods just outside our home and what we have here is cleavers which are a great immune system booster. They're also called um, sweethearts, they're called um, uh, sticky willies, sticky goose, willy, grass. goose grass. Yeah. And then we have, we also had these in our juice, fresh juice today. Then you've got whorehound, which is fantastic for the respiratory system and for coughs and as an expectorant. And we have nettles, which are great for iron um, in the blood, and they are a purifier and a tonic for um, our kidneys. So that's what we're going to have inside our hot water. And then, uh, just because I need to be true to my my African heritage, these are um, this is baobab fruit, and it's called it's it's what um uh, oh what's this called? It'll come back to me. I'm sure I'll taste it again. It's uh, yeah. Anyway, we're just bringing our kettle to, to the table. I think Ash and Flora make their way back with their tea. We'd like to invite you all to switch your video on so we can see each other, those who are happy to do so. 
And then as Lily said, yeah, if you go onto um, gallery view, you'll all be able to see each other. So I'm unmuting people, but please do re-mute yourself if you want to. So does this mean we'll see everybody? You should see everybody, everybody who, who is happy to be visible. And if you go on gallery view, Misha and Flora, you'll be able to see. Mm. Mm. <laughs> people are popping in, people are zipping up. Karen says she, she can't, can you turn her video on? Oh, I've done, I thought I'd done that. Um, you done muted me, but not um, turn my video. For some oh, reason, I can't do it my, my video. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. I do that with everybody. Um, Kate, can you advise us how we see the gallery? Yeah, people. So if you go up to your top right. Yeah. And you, it should at the moment say you're on gal, you're on speaker view. So if you click, it will put you onto gallery view. Okay. And then you see everybody. Um, we are just on an iPhone, so. Oh, you can't do it on an iPhone. Right, I might go and get our iPad then, and so we can see everyone. Okay. Well, should well, we? Well, I think we can carry on because at least we can hear each other. Yeah. Okay. So, so just um, for, for everyone else's. Um, uh, benefit with Lily and I and Tanisha and Laura felt it would be more straightforward if we asked the question so there's not too many because there's a strange thing that seems to happen in the virtual realm where if one person asks a question everybody else becomes kind of peripheral so actually um, we'll ask your question so we've got some great ones coming in um, there's an interesting conversation uh, about the the origins of the word um, elixir, but it was then very succinctly um, answered. Um, <laughs> so I'll actually um, I'll just do these at random and then up as well. So a nice a nice straightforward one to start with. What's the garbage fermented with? Oh, that's a beautiful one, and I'm sorry I didn't actually say it's so simple, but I always forget. Um, there's a misunderstanding sometimes that because some cabbages that you buy in um, the, the, the shops have water with them, that they're actually in a vinegar. But actually, a true fermentation comes from the, the plant, vegetable, with salt and thyme. Great. Thanks. And so it's just a question of, what, what happens is that the salt, you've, you've cut, you've shredded the cabbage and then you've massaged it with your hands and you're, you're adding salt to it. And as you massage, the, the salt starts impregnating into the cell walls. And basically that is what creates the releases, um, uh, the sugars to start doing the fermentation. And then slowly, slowly after about a week, um, the salt, the, so the liquid comes up over the cabbage, but that's all from the salt and the massaging of the cabbage. And then over time, the fermentation happens with the bubbling coming up and then it becomes dry and that is the cabbage has become fermented. Great. Thanks, Mish. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, there is something really interesting about the connection with the inanimate. By engaging in an active relationship with your tools, food, utensils, are we making these inanimate objects animated? Ah, so 
my relationship with food has opened my eyes and my relationship with um, uh, Zen Buddhism and the practice of cooking within a Zen retreat has, and I guess also my relationship with the esoteric and with um, ancient wisdoms has opened my eyes to the fact that um, there is no inanimate world. Um, the world is animate around us. There is sentience, there is a sensibility, there, there is sentience to matter. And it's about how we revive our relationship to matter and revive our relationship to sentience. And I think if we think that the world is inanimate, then we can cause a lot of problems because we think there's no feelingness, there's no consciousness going on. So I think when one starts working with um, an understanding of animism uh, and uh, the world as sentience and that matter has agency, then everything around becomes alive. So that, and I know these, there are a lot of anecdotes which sort of bring this into, into a, a more popular understanding. When somebody dies that was close to you and they had a watch or they had a computer, for some strange reason, when that person dies, the watch stops at the time of their death or a computer stops working. And those kinds of anecdotes, I think, show that we are in a continuous relationship with the objects around us and in fact when i was studying as an art therapist i wrote a uh, my first essay was called object magic and it was the idea that we invest in a relationship we are we are not just observing and are not just separate from mm -hmm. and i think that's an understanding of animism and a relationship to our world that makes a very different approach to um what it means to be a human being if you're constantly like this this beautiful object um it has it has meaning and matter and memory and history for me so it's not just a dead object and i think that's how a relationship to food can help bring an understanding of what it means to enliven our relationship children have no problem with amazon <laughs> And with with the animate earth because they're in constant dialogue with with their toys with their with a with a branch that they make into a ship or a um a, a sand sand pit that becomes a, a whole universe for them so i think it's about extending our our understanding of what it means to live as human beings in an other than human world which is in relationship and constant um conversation with Great. Thanks, Misha. Um, I'm going to choose one. I'm going to sort of start from bottom up. Hmm. Can I just say, we have actually just got our iPad going. So if it is possible um, to be, we've asked to be invited in. If we can be invited, we yeah, might be able to see everyone. You. There you are. Sorry. Thank you so much. That's perfect. So now we can. Um, oh, good. See everybody. Oh, <laughs> Wonderful to see you all in your own homes. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we're ready to um Okay, so um ask me to start our video, is that right? Okay. Yeah, great. So the question is, um, what are the acts of collecting involved in your collaborative practice? The acts of collecting or connecting? Collecting. Mm. Collecting. Mm. Wow, that's, that could be taken so many ways. How would you like to take it? Collecting. Um, we do help collect each other's thoughts. Um, so one of our commitments is to have the energy in. We have a natural energy and interest in each other's oh, thoughts. Raising your hand. Um, um, I'm just gonna get, get them right. I'm taking you out of. Um, your, I'm taking your iPhone off, Nish and Flora, because I think it's giving us some feedback. Thank you. And someone had their hand raised. I wonder if it was their question. Hmm. Thank this you. is my question. Hello. Hello, Mish. It's my question because I think you collect both the 
elixirs and the objects and the furniture and I think you collectively collect yes. and um, that you collect the utensils in which you place the food and you select that very carefully mm. so there's an element of the very best curation that's undertaken mm. collectively and there's a history and tradition of that and there's beginning to be um, a lot of interest in terms of mm. visual arts in collaborative collection within the home mm. so I wondered what your thoughts were about so it goes, it ties back, I'll, I'll carry on with this and then you'll be able to take up. Um, it goes back to what I was sharing about um, the animate and the inanimate. Um, I would say that mostly what I have been collecting and what has been brought into the, the orbit of my life have been things that are meaningful objects. So I was raised in Africa, I was born in Zimbabwe. I was in South Africa a lot for my work as researcher. My, my father was there too. So, and I've traveled and I also have French heritage. So, um, objects called to me. And um, part of what gives a kind of a glow and a, a, a um, uh, a feeling sense to all the projects and all the work that I do and all the way that I lead my life here has because there is as I said there's there's history you know this is a this is from Zimbabwe um, some of the things I don't have a history with but they talk to me of a history so these are Florentine um, uh, uh, trays that I collected I found in a second-hand shop and they have just become part of, of, of my, um, my day. And there's that, that idea that it's not just a holder of food, it's a tray. When I bring this tray to Flora with, um, with uh, tea on it, the tea, a new luster appears to the food. And for example, um, all these um, beautiful old, um, these are special sourdough, um, Suffolk sourdough uh, bowls, again, that's helped me have a, more of a relationship to the local because I'm not from Suffolk, I'm not English, but somehow having found these bowls here, it sort of gives, it gives a, a legitimacy and, a, and, a, and a, a, um, an honouring of where I am. So my, all my bowls are very different. Then baskets, baskets galore. Um, <laughs> You know, and then someone's given me a beautiful candle holder. That became my ritual candle holder. It's, I guess, it's about imbuing. Some objects come through history and through my choice, and some come through my imbuing them with um, uh, an interest and an energy. And I think that's a lot what happens with um, ritual in indigenous cultures. And Zimbabwe, you know, the masks and the, the costumes um they were imbued with uh, um, energy and force because they had a relationship to ritual and to a history and a lineage um and i think that i became aware that objects have that magic to them uh, uh and they also can become deadened and i know that uh, ben okri has written some extraordinary poetry about how we can just use and exploit objects for our own our own um, uh, purposes. And I feel very, very uh, sensitive and alert to how I can be always with objects in a way that is um, uh, full of respect. Mm. And I think what I love about that word respect is that it's about renewing our vision. To respect is to, is, comes from respectare, to see again, to renew. Mm. And I think that with objects that I haven't had a relationship with, I think, okay, through what I'm doing here, hopefully I'm renewing their, their energy and their, the, the miracles that they bring to, um, to holding and hosting our lives. I mean, in a way, those vessels are, are containers, they're crucibles for new ways of thinking as well and being. Mm. How has it been for you, this collecting? And Because we've also had collaborative collections. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful question and it's a really lovely to hear your 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 perspective on it and um i i i identify with having a quaker background so my aesthetic was one of minimalism and um <laughs> and we um it's been an incredible learning journey to witness me going into an antique store or uh, and and finding and being found by objects 
um, and furnishing the home with them. I think one of the things that I get very moved by is she'll buy something that I can see absolutely no purpose for whatsoever. And I'll say it at the time, I'll say, no, I really don't see how that is going to in any way enhance our life or your practice or our inquiry. And then within about 24 hours, it's become utterly indispensable <laughs> and so obvious that we needed a three level cake tier system in order to display soil samples. So it's that reappropriation of kitsch things and then becoming and, and also honoring. I mean, often I'll, she'll buy something and I'll say it's broken and then she'll say I'll wash it. I'll mend it, I'll oil it. And she's out in the garden oiling what to me looks like a really rusty piece of agricultural equipment. And, and then the next day, everyone is saying, where did you find that weighing machine? It reminds <laughs> me of my father. And it becomes, evokes something. There's poetry in, in, in it all. So I've overcome my um, defaults, which is to say, do we really need it? And to actually now go, yes, at every in every junk store we go to or and it's and it's not excessive it's very restrained but it's um not immediately obvious how that object will live what and, it's what it's what its life is going to become and i think part of to answer that question as well to amplify what flo is saying you know putting two objects together in the very dada and surrealist way can actually make something come into a completely new association that gives it a new life force and so I love, I love playing with those, um, those ways of being. Yeah, I'll keep talking. Thank you for that great question. Are there things you'd like to share about it? A head shake. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, not particularly. It's just a long-standing area of interest. Yeah. The idea and I think, of collecting I think the word, in the home. Yeah, and the word curation is very much part of it. And the idea of curation is it's not just about putting objects together. Curare comes from the word to care, and yes, so it exactly. is about that care. Exactly. Thank you. The ability over time then to Ex alter things very yes. gently or quite severely yeah. within the home. Yeah. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Um, do, I, I'm, I'm going to be selfish and ask my own question. Um, but when I was watching you uh, uh, stir and select, and just watching your body move through and navigate the kitchen and in in these kind of really uh, functional uh, pedestrian ways of moving from one thing to another but also the detail of how you touch these objects how you stir something and i just had this question about um do you, are you drawn to particular aspects of your culinary practice that meet your body needs do you, are there particular practices that you know will give your body something a comfort or an energy or what's that like? Does that make sense? <laughs> question. <laughs> it does, and it's so interesting. Yesterday, when I was just trying to get a feel about which particular board I might use for the, um, because I did, I, you know, this has given us an incredible opportunity to just refresh um, my my Adora, um, and I was thinking, mm, that board that I have been using, hmm, it's not the one I really need, and I was washing it up. And then my body was just called to look down and back. And I looked down and back to the base of Adora and guess what was there? The board that my mother used in France, which I rescued and brought back when the house was being sold and realized that that board had probably been made by, had come from my father's building site. And he probably said, oh, Cecile, here, would you like this board to be your chopping board? So that became very meaningful for me to work with. So in a way that's to do with my health. It's to do with my emotional health. It's to do with my history. It's to do with uh, a recognition of, of my ancestry. And that immediately makes all my molecules chuckle, you know, and I feel good because not only am I making 11, I'm actually on my mother's board. Um, the leaven itself, all these foods that you're seeing, they are only to do with my own health because I had a serious car accident in my late twenties and I was basically told I'd never walk again. And if I did, I'd have to have operations through the rest of my life. And between yoga, eating organic food, eating um, a, a diet that was conscious and doing practices and living my own passion, I have had no operations and I'm still um, up and about. So all these, um, 
ingredients, all these processes, they have come to me because I was looking for ways to enhance my own health. But I also knew that in enhancing my own health it was a political practice. And I think that's the key thing for me. I'm not just interested in doing this for myself. My life here is, is, is part of a purpose for a much greater whole. And cooking for the Zen retreats was an understanding that I wasn't cooking because I'm interested in cooking. I was cooking for the participants and the retreatants good sense of well-being and their comfort and their energy levels so that became i had to do a lot of thinking and reading about what were foods at particular times of the day that would make sense which which foods would be heavier which foods would be lighter so i learned a lot about the yin and the yang of food and the macrobiotic way of cooking food the macrobiotic way what macrobiotic way of chopping vegetables so that you got the best essence out of them so that you didn't just get the yin energy and the yang energy, you'd get a diversity of energies. Um, and then all these fermentation processes, so many cultures throughout the world know that you begin a food, a meal with a fermented process because it ha actually helps the, the body gut flora to start receiving food. So, um, and also there's something about the, the way you present food. The eyes are actually the first thing that begins the digestion. So if you start seeing food and the smells, so it's actually such a holistic experience to live with food, which has been calling to you because it's actually going to nourish you and to nurture you and to be your health giver. And if you're working with the foods that are in the local geography and the soils, if you're having honey, you have an in, and, uh, some hay fever and you have the honey from that area, the hay fever will actually be um, uh, neutralized because you're working with what's in the region. And I think that's what the, the wisdom of local and global is. It's not because we're just saying, oh, let's not travel far. It's actually because the soils give you the nutrients that you need in that particular place and the seasons. So I would say that the whole of this artisan kitchen is, is one that's based on, on food, let food be thy medicine. Lily, do you want to pick a question or shall I keep going? Yeah, I've, I uh, picked this one. How do you decide where and how to place the elixirs, powders, oils, etc.? So how do, you, how do you decide where and how to place them? So do um, you mean on the, on the shelf? That was Erica's question. That was Erica, yeah. Do you yeah. want to expand? Yes, do I have to place them on the shelf or next to each other? What goes next to what? How do you make these decisions? Um, that's such a beautiful question, Erica, because what I've realized about my life is that. Um, There's I, Erica. Hello, Erica. <laughs> hello, Erica. Erica, I, I've discovered that a really wondrous way to live a life is to try and make no decisions about anything. <laughs> and I, I talk about the sympoetic flow and the sympoetic sensibility and I really do I, I have liberated I have, I have surrendered to it and that means that I have no idea why anything is with each other <laughs> they are there because somehow there was a relationship between my hand that bottle obviously there were some things that are constellated like all the things that I have made myself are in the one corner. If something has got something like a tincture from uh, 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 an artisan practitioner, then I'm just sort of creating little categories. But essentially, where things find themselves, and sometimes those definitely migrate, and they migrate for a good reason, because actually at that moment, the dandelion tincture was telling me that it wanted to be with the mint. But if I had just only placed it away from itself, it wouldn't have known its new relationship. And I think that's how I cook as well. Somebody once, I call it tribal cooking, not because it's from certain tribes, but because I think that all the foods that I work with are, are from a tribe. And if you keep trying, if you keep with the tribes in their own way of being cooked, and then you bring them together, it's a bit as though the tribes have come to an understanding that they're with each other in their community and they're now safe to join the carrot tribe. So the potato tribe has now decided, okay, I have yielded of all my goodness in my form, in my shape, in my textures, in my essence. Now I'm happy to go with the carrot. So 
I think the similar thing with the elixirs is that they, they are of their own essence, but they also get mixed, some incredible mixtures. I mean, I found one of the mixtures today was um, three or four different kinds of balsamic vinegar mixed with black peppercorns and green sencha tea. I didn't make that decision. <laughs> Somehow the green tea called to me, the balsamic vinegar was next door to the stove, that kind of thing. So I don't know if that answers your questions. Obviously there are some things, I know that if I'm working with homeopathic remedies, I will not put a homeopathic remedy next door to something that's very pungent and very strong because that would neutralize the homeopathy. But in my kitchen, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very, things find their own, their own way. And I, I am, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a witness and I'm a bit of a, a follower. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> which means that there are beautiful accidents that happen, which are not accidents. The associations happen and incredible new, new tastes are born. So we have, a, we have about three or four minutes left to our allotted time. And I'm, I'm aware that um, some people already have had other meetings um, to get to. Um, I'm just thinking if I can summarize any, there's, um, it kind of ties into Erica's question, but there's lots of really great uh, comments and questions around the choreography of the kitchen. So how you move around the kitchen, how things are placed. Um, uh, which is actually beautifully nice for you, Flora, phrase the geography of the kitchen, mm. So mm. bringing together of your practice. Um, so does anybody have a question that they want to ask? We're a slightly smaller group. I think if you just want to say it, that's fine in the last few minutes. I just wanted to mention this one comment, um, really, that someone's written that's, I love that you're, Sympoetic activity is not hidden behind closed cupboards, but out there owning their magic, beauty and activities. And I think I, I also really love seeing all the jars and bottles and things there out on the shelf. It's like they're kind of like little art pieces themselves, little installations of... They are, and I think Erica, to go back to your question, because I think what um, uh, Lily has just shared is exactly it. Everything is on view. So these are, it, everything is a little creature with its own little, own little energies and forces and intentions. And um, it's, a, it's a very relaxing way of leading a life <laughs> because I don't have to try and make it. I mean, I didn't decide this is time to make um, a kefir. My friend brought me a kefir and I went, okay, I'll, I'll experiment with that. So it's about tuning in to what's about around. And if all of these cupboards were covered, I couldn't tune in. And I think that it's, it's about having, and the vessels, even the vessels. And I know that it is true, some, maybe one would get a bit overwhelmed by seeing all of this, but they don't all call to me at once. <laughs> You know, things are visible, but they, they, I'm drawn. Like today, I just thought, hmm, last night I thought, oh, I feel like some of um, uh, Hot Dodd's delicious yellow split pea dal. So I just got it down, put it in a, in a bowl, and it's cooking in a, in a dish, and it's in the oven now. But I didn't think, oh, that's what we're going to have for lunch. It's just they called to me today. And maybe just to reflect on that, that um, uh, Mish just said a little bit more about the cooking with the senses. That no, you say, hon was just noticing that if things are visible, then your, your intuitive self that knows you're lacking a micronutrient or knows that you're needing a particular kind of carbohydrate, it can then choose the rice or it can choose the, the plant that you need. So then being visible allows the senses to um, uh, come, come to forward. Be in a dance, to, to be, be in, in a, a dance. dance. I, I'm in a dance in the kitchen. Yeah. And I'm not sure how much time we've got left, but I just want to please, I'm just starting to see all the people who are here. I just have such gratitude for the time that you've taken to be with me. Some of you who I know, some of you who are in faraway places. Um, it's very moving to um, invite you here because this strange transformative time is actually um, stimulating new practices in the world. And I think that we were honored to be part of this uh, invitation from C. Dare because I think 
it has changed my way of being here in my kitchen and and our relationship to 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 these to this object magic mm. so and um, um, I thank you all for having made that time and energy and, mm. and given the I've, I came up with this idea this morning that what I was doing yesterday was tending to the kitchen I wasn't tidying it or I wasn't sort of making it beautiful for all of you I was tending it I was tending the creatures I was tending the relationships I was tending my body mind and it, it was a very different feeling than if I'd had to pack all of these things into the car, <laughs> into a van usually, to come and be with you, which is what I usually have done for 50, 20, years. 20 years. This is the first time I've had the ease and the grace and the relaxation to just go, oh, everyone's coming to me here. We can just be with ourselves for a little while and then we're going to share ourselves with you. So that's what we've been doing in our kitchen. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for attending. It's very, it's a tender, tender experience with you all. Oh, can I leave with one thing? Yes. If you read one and I'll read one. Which one? I think that's, I'd like to read that one. Okay, yeah. As an artist, I would say this is what has been my, my uh, manifesto. There is a need for new forms emphasizing our, our essential interconnectedness rather than separateness. Forms evoking the feeling of belonging to a larger whole. And that is Susie Gablick, a visual artist and extraordinary um, theorist of the arts. It's hard to choose actually, but... This is a, a piece of writing from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who was the author of The Little Prince. And this, um, this was a very powerful, he, he invites that if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn or long for the vast and endless sea. And I think that's what I've seen in Misha's practice is that rather than instruct people on how to eat more nutritiously or think about ecology or feel more connected, she creates environments which are sensual and welcoming and safe and intimate. And when they enter that space and she's interested in um, them and their experience of that encounter with that space it opens up in people a longing and that longing can be very diverse it can be a longing for stillness it can be a longing for delicious food it can be a longing for to break bread with somebody and they will find their own way to build their ship they will find their own way to manifest that practice in their life their own to go onto the sea to go onto the sea but that's a different theory of social change from the kind of environmental movement I grew up with in the 80s, which was very much about determining how we should respond. So I've been very moved by this idea of, of trusting people's longing, which goes back to Kate, your word, trust that people long for the sea. And you just need to create environments where people can reconnect with that longing. And then and they build their own little vessels. And they build beautiful, original, completely diverse, mind-blowing vessels. And particularly in South Africa, watching Mish work with people, seeing them instinctively know how to use those spaces to really evoke something in themselves. And then to come back six months later and discover they've manifest something really extraordinary because it awoke that, that yearning for something, dignity, nutrition, safety, beauty, whatever it evoked, they'd manifest it. And they had the courage to do that because they were witnessed and supported in that encounter. And that's, I think, <coughs> what's been very moving about this experience with you today. It's about more longings in me um, to be with you all in person. Yes, Actually, when are we going to be I want with to each meet other? you all in person, um, which I think could happen later this year. But yeah, deep appreciations for you all giving such generously your time and your concentration and your, and your listening ears. Thank you very, very much. Thank you both. I think on behalf of um, all of us here and uh, Cedar and myself and Lily, just uh, I, I just want to extend such huge thanks and appreciation to you both. And I know I mentioned this at the beginning, but it feels really pertinent here that we haven't arrived at this through a series of emails that no. me, Laura, myself and Lily have zoomed into each other's houses. We've cried together over the shock of this strange situation. We've moved each other. Lily's lovely daughters have zoomed in. We've seen cats and dogs and teenagers with no top. <laughs> it's been that, that curatorial journey to get us here. 
has not just been it's not been at all uh linear or or extra so it feels it feels like a real journey and it's been such a it's been a really uh great um uh experience for for me certainly and i'm sure lily is with me and also thank you to sarah who made the introduction um between the two centers and um brought Mish and flora to us and we're going to cling on to them and make sure they <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Oh, thank, also, you actually, thank you so much for inviting us into your home it's but i said when we first zoomed that i almost felt my temperature go up like there's a warmth <laughs> the in the kitchen. so it just feels so special to be in your home thank you thank you you have invested our next meal with all your beautiful energy so inside those um essex grown yellow split peas you will be with us <laughs> Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye.